Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever time it is you're tuning in for the Wilson Weekly with Graham Home, your money mentor, and as always, Dr. Andrew Wilson. G'day, Doc. How are you? Yeah, g'day, Graham. You look like you're in a different spot today. Where are you in the world? I'm uh, a little, uh, little a couple of days away with the lovely wife. So, Beck and I just whisked away for a few days. Um, got a couple of live events, as you know, back to back and a few yes. things on. So, we just need a couple of days of planning and... Uh, Bit of a break, so a lovely Noosa this week. Uh, excellent. Yeah, my neck of the woods. I've uh, been a resident of Noosa on and off for a number of years and uh, have some property up there. So, uh, yeah, I was it's actually good expecting, to, uh, expecting to see you at the cafe one morning, Doc. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll work on that one, Graham. But uh, I'm in lovely Sydney today, been very humid and hot in Sydney. We had a couple of 40 degree days last week mm. in Sydney, which was tough to tackle. We had the air conditioner on full blast. Uh, to to, uh, to offset, uh, and, and it's still very humid and sticky here, but uh, that's summer for you, mate. Uh, mm-hmm. No getting away from it. And before you know it, we'll all be whinging about how cold we are. So uh, <laughs> let's, true. Let's, all, let's all make the most of it. But uh, the, the, uh, I guess we could say the housing market's heating up now, uh, in, certainly in terms of uh, moving beyond the, the holiday hiatus that we have every year. Uh, we've got the auction market starting this weekend. Interesting to see how many numbers we get to begin the year. We had about 400 auctions in Sydney and Melbourne last year uh, in the first weekend of February. Um, we'll probably get similar numbers this year. So uh, that gives us something to speak about. But as we always discuss auction activity, weekend auction activity is a very good forward indicator of what's happening generally in the market. But we've got some big news today, Graham. Uh, the first house price, home price report of the year. This is hot off the press, the January home price report. Uh, So it is the January quarter. That's the three months to January versus the three months to December. Um, Other uh, uh, house price modelers have also sent their data out today, but they uh, have had that embargoed until tomorrow, which, of course, is the 1st of February. But ours is an embargo. We send ours out on the last day of the month, straight hot off the press. So everybody gets the first with the latest from my housing market and infinity, and that's what you'd expect, wouldn't you, Graham? I'd expect nothing less, Doc. If you're not first, you're last. Exactly, and <laughs> uh, it is some interesting results, so we'll have a look at that. We've also got um, the first RBA meeting of the year next week, Graham. Of course, this is a different year for the RBA. They've changed mm. the goalposts to some degree. There will be fewer meetings, um, different environment. The Reserve Bank Governor has to front the media. Da-dum, you know, after the uh, after the announcement of the result and lots of questions there, so that'll be interesting. But uh, we'll have a little bit of a preview of where we expect or certainly what we expect the factors to be as part of that decision-making by the Reserve Bank mm. next week. So I'll have a look at that. And uh, also, uh, literally hot off the press today, we have the latest inflation data for December. And, of course, that'll play a big part in the Reserve Bank's decision next week. So we'll have a quick, uh, we don't have any slides on that because it is just straight off the press, literally. But we, uh, I know the results, so we'll have a quick chat about that one. And also we had retail sales data for December released uh, yesterday. So mm. we'll discuss the retail sales data. Not a big surprise there because it did come up after that uh, spectacular November. November's the big month for spending by consumers, of course, Black Friday, so no surprise that retail sales were down a little bit. So we can get going if you like. Uh, Absolutely. And, well, let's, uh, let's rip in. Let's rip into it. Here and, here first, uh, my, ladies and gentlemen. There's no embargo here. No embargo here. Yes, you get it uh, as it happens. So as soon as the last data is released on the through the month, uh, we're modelling it and, and out it comes. And uh, I think you'll find there's not a lot of difference between uh, our results and other results of house price modelers. Uh, the only difference is you get it all first here, and uh, I think that's important. So my housing market, and that's what I we all, always are here at my housing market and Infinity about the current state and future prospects of housing markets. And current state really is exactly what we're going to discuss today, uh, because we're going to start off with uh, the latest home price data. This is for the January quarter uh, 
this year. Uh, retail sales we mentioned also we'll discuss and what to expect from the upcoming RBA rate decision next week. So January home prices, home prices steady to begin 2024, um, steady results generally, and it does continue that underlying easing trend of gross rates that emerged over the final months of 2023. Mm. I've been having uh, a number of discussions with media today around the reasonings behind this. It's no surprise, Graham. We've come through a very strong year in 2023. Uh, these things can't continue on without a driving force. Uh, of course, a lot of the growth in house prices last year was catch-up energy, uh, yeah. particularly in Melbourne and Sydney that fell away in 2022. Uh, we also had a lot of demand that was pent up when we did have higher interest rates and a lot of scare headlines, scary headlines in the media, and that caused buyers and sellers to sit on their hands. Uh, but eventually those buyers and sellers came back into the market last year and uh, that released that pent-up demand, and most of that pent-up demand uh, was uh, satisfied by the end of the year. So it's all part of the cycle, Graham. Uh, affordability constraints start to rise higher prices, higher interest rates, and, of course, we still have high inflation, not as high as it was, which is constraining household budgets. So at the end of the day, it pushes buyers out of the market, so we have fewer buyers. Um, and that's the good thing about this year coming up is the prospects that will have a, uh, a much more certain and reliable outcome for uh, the house price activity because uh, we've moved through all those post-COVID disruptions, COVID disruptions, higher interest rate disruptions, and now we're sort of back to ground zero, if you understand what I mean. Um, yeah. So, But, of course, we've always said, we say this, and we've said it a few times over the journey, Graham, that, oh, hey, we're finally back to sort of level, level again, and then something comes along to disrupt yeah. it. So let's hope we don't see that this year, um, but certainly the prospects are for uh, a, a much more moderate, housing market uh, environment this year. Not that we won't have any growth. I still think most capitals are going to record growth. And in fact, I think some of those uh, uh, capitals such as Perth and Brisbane that were the strongest last year, I think they'll continue to be strong mm. this year. Uh, the question is whether they'll get those double-figure prices growth. But uh, no surprise we've started the year off with flatter price activity um, because it's also about the fact that uh, this includes the January quarter includes, of course, January and December, which are holiday months, even yep. though our methodology, our price models do uh, tend to offset the seasonal factors. There's obviously still some seasonal factors uh, in the early year data because we don't have the same mix of properties that are being sold and uh, because we have much fewer, many fewer uh higher priced properties in the marketplace over the holiday period. Um, that'll start to pick up when the mix will start to uh, become more even. So there's more middle and lower priced properties as a proportion of the market through this holiday period. So, of course, that tends to push prices uh, downwards. But we do offset that because we use a particular model that does that. Uh, but nonetheless, it is still a bit of an influence on outcomes. So let's have a look at the results. Enough of the chat. The national house price was flat, Graham, over the uh, January quarter, and that follows 11 consecutive months of increases. So a pretty good ride there through 2023 until that December quarter result. And these are rolling quarters, of course, so we're moving every month forward by three months. Um, so we get a nice, reliable and solid um, um, uh, house price model. So first, uh, the first non-growth month, quarterly month uh, since um, February or January last year, Graham. So perhaps no coincidence that January again yeah. has been a flatter month going forward. Uh, but I think you know anybody who lo looks at that chart there, the national house prices will will certainly understand that last year was a very good year uh, for the Definitely national didn't housing see those market. Ten, twenty, or thirty percent declines that the media was spruiking, Doc. I can't see that anywhere in those 11 increases. Well, it went the other way, Graham. We had nearly 10% <laughs> increase in national prices. I mean, how crazy yeah. is that? It wasn't down. It was up, but it was up by as much as it was supposed to be down. Um, <laughs> gee whiz, you know, I think they're going to have to revisit their career options or choices, those that make <laughs> these forecasts, because uh, 
you know, you wouldn't want to be a, a doctor or a dentist, something making these types of mistakes, would you, going forward? But nonetheless, it's all part of the game. And, uh, you know, it, it uh, I guess, encourages those that uh, do get it right um, to continue on with what they're doing. And, look, it's it's okay and it's a bit of a joke perhaps to some degree, uh, you know, these t- term and gloom headlines, as long as you're not making decisions based on that, Graham, because mm. that's when you can burn your fingers. Because we're not talking sheep stations here, we're talking real Australian real estate, which is, yeah. uh, you know, a, a big time uh, asset class. So uh, flat over to start the year, but it does in, in a way continue the weakening trend that we saw emerging over last year. And as I said, that's due to affordability constraints rising because of such a strong year, high prices, higher interest rates, high prices generally, not just house prices, uh, have started to squeeze buyers out of the market and the satisfaction of a lot of that pent-up demand that was created in 2022 and early 2023. So no surprises going forward. And of course, we discussed this as uh, as uh, an outcome and we did start to see that at the end of last year. So here's the numbers, Graham. So uh, Sydney just down slightly by 0.4 of a percent uh, over the month, Melbourne down 0.2 of a percent. Brisbane still growing, Graham, up by 0.9 of a percent. Adelaide just drifted back 0.7 a percent. Perth again, uh, the strongest performer over the month, up by 1.1 percent. Gee, how strong has that Perth market been, Graham, yeah. over the last year? It certainly uh, led all the capital cities in terms of growth. We do understand that Perth had a pretty down time. Uh, I was going to say, know, Doc, it's, it's come from a pretty low base. There's a lot oh, of recovery, a lot of recovery, yeah. rather, rather than growth there to get that growth figure. Absolutely, and and look at its median house price, which has obviously grown significantly mm. over the past year, but it's still grown well below Adelaide and Brisbane. In fact, it's nearly a mm. hundred thousand dollars lower than Brisbane. And you know, Perth has the highest incomes in the country, mate. So it does. Uh, you know, I mean, it means you've got a lot more bang for your buck in Perth in terms of what your income is versus what house prices are. So uh, no surprise that it, it's growing Perth stronger than anywhere else because it has affordability advantages uh, and that's what's driving that market as well as the catch-up, the, the decade-long catch-up I think we're going through with Perth, which really did tank at the end of the uh, that last mining boom in 20, 2012 and has really only been picking up over the last year or two. Um, so, yeah, Perth, the, the best performer, up by 1.1%. The smaller capitals are, are still struggling a little bit. Hobart down by 1.1%, but Hobart tends to go up when everybody's going down and then it goes down when everybody else is going up. So uh, we look forward to a, a revival in Hobart this year, but it has had some quite strong years, Hobart, over the last three or four years. Uh, Darwin down 1.8%, uh, but that Darwin market is a... Uh, uh, a, a very seasonal market because of the wet and the dry up in Darwin. Yeah. It virtually means there's two two market seasons up there. Uh, Canberra just starting to pick up uh, up by 0.2 of a percent. Um, I think that Canberra market bears watching this year because it did have a flat period through the second half of last year, just some early signs that it would pick up. And as usual, looks like following that uh, hotter Sydney market um, this year, through uh, through the early months at least. We'll see what happens. But when we look at the full year results, uh, Sydney up 10%, still Graham. Melbourne, the underperformer up 3.2%. Similar to Canberra, I think that Melbourne market's got a lot of upside to it. Yeah. Uh, still lacks a bit of confidence, but early signs are that that Melbourne market is picking up. No doubt the rental market in Melbourne is, uh, is activating. Uh, and also I think the unit market for buyers is also picking up more buyers for units in Melbourne as well. But Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, real standouts there, particularly Brisbane and uh, Perth. Perth up 17% over the past year uh, and Brisbane up nearly 14% over the past year, Graham. So they've been very strong performers, clearly the best performers. And, you know, we saw all that uh, migration surge, uh, you know, activate the Brisbane market through COVID. Everybody sort of fled Melbourne, fled Sydney, headed into southeast Queensland because they thought it was safer. That pushed up rents and prices. Well, it pushed them through the roof. Um, and it was then like, okay, well, COVID's over, lockdown's over, so that'll mean that prices will start to, because the migration surge will end, um, that, so prices will start to ease. But it hasn't happened, Graham. Brisbane still keep on, is still keeping on keeping on 
Uh, mm. and, and most of those southeast Queensland markets, uh, you know, the Gold Coast. I know Rebecca uh, and I, Doc, we actually sold a couple of properties over the weekend at the big auction event on the Gold Coast. Uh, and, right. Um, and the median price has now cracked a million dollars on the coast. And I sold a two bedroom unit for $1.2 million on the weekend. Wow. Ex- oh, a two that's bedroom fantastic. Unit. Well, and, and this, the, the point is, Graham, that it doesn't look like it's ended yet, that there's still no. plenty of upside. And, you know, the people saying, okay, well, Gold Coast, Brisbane has, have had its boom. Like that was a year ago, but it just keeps on rising. Um, mm. So a very, very strong market still, and the Gold Coast particularly strong, as you've just with personal. Uh, mm. with personal results have validated, you know, what a strong market that is. And, um, you know, those that got into the Gold Coast a year or two ago would certainly have big smiles on their faces, you know, in terms of what they've uh, what they've realised. Looks like you've got a big smile on your face too, Greg. <laughs> and uh, it, it's not just the it's not just the return, the, the capital growth, it's also, of course, the uh, yeah, rental increases, which are oh, still the, very the yield, strong. The yields throughout all of South East Queensland, Doc, are just phenomenal, but they're getting the growth that historically we only used to see in Sydney and Melbourne, you know, Sydney and Melbourne. We're getting yeah. that growth in southeast Queensland plus the yield, so it's just yes. it, it's phenomenal. And and that's the point that usually high yields point to an undervalued market, but yeah. uh, but it, you know yields are holding, uh, even though capital growth is is doing what it usually does with a with a um, an out of sync yield. Uh, it's because rents keep rising, so they're sort of keeping up with capital growth. So that means it's stabilising the yield. So is this not a perfect world for investors in that sense? Big yields inclusive of higher rents and capital growth as well. So uh, some very big results there. When we look at the previous peak, we can see that uh, those strong markets, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, are all tracking around about their record prices at the moment. Uh, Sydney and Melbourne still down below their previous peaks of the cycle which uh, in both those instances was the March quarter 2022, Graham. Uh, we forget, I guess we're looking forward <laughs> all the time, we forget about what's happened previously, but of course we had a very strong boom in 21 22, uh, and Melbourne and Sydney house prices are still below where they were at the peak of that boom in, 20, in, March, in the March quarter 2022. So it's still some value there, Mel, uh, Graham, uh, when we discuss that because, of course, that's uh, – uh, you know, nearly two years ago, and uh, since then incomes have, have risen, rents have risen. So uh, it means there's still value opportunities in the Sydney and Melbourne market. Sydney still down by 1.2 percent, and Melbourne down by 3.8 percent. No, uh, no surprise that the trends are mostly downwards when we compare to the previous month's results. Uh, those arrow trends are mostly downwards, uh, reflecting that easing in activity. Over the uh, over the past uh, over the past couple of quarters, but as I said, this is exactly what uh, what happens with the cycle once it reaches its peak. Um, and what we look out for is those that are moving against the cycle in the sense. Uh, and we can certainly say Brisbane and Perth are still climbing upwards, um, and they're certainly the good pro- growth prospects or the top growth prospects at this stage for 2024. Uh, unit prices fell away, Graham. It's interesting with units. Units also had a strong year last year overall, but with houses they also fell away. But um, that uh, the, the period during uh, that January quarter period again has some seasonal impacts. There's fewer unit sales activity going on through that period, so that tends to push the unit price down, particularly given fewer higher priced units in the marketplace. But once I think it's interesting that even though we had a strong year. Overall, in units, as we can see there, we had a strong year, just a dip down there or, or a settled uh, period there over September. Um, it was sort of the reverse of the year before, Graham, because if you remember, uh, units were the top performers during 2022. Uh, they outperformed houses, and, and last year we saw houses outperform units. So it was a bit of a balancing act between the two years. Um so I guess that's that's what we want to see is that it all evening out, which I think it has. But uh, yeah, a lower a lower quarter there for units uh, compared to previous quarters. Um, national unit price uh, was was uh, was down marginally over the uh, over that uh, uh, over that period over the um, uh, uh, January quarter down by 0.7 of a percent. Um, 
and of course, this the national price is a weighted average, Graham, as we know. So it accounts for the prices based on the volumes of sales in uh, each of the capital cities. And we know that Sydney certainly takes the lion's share of the volume of unit sales, followed by Melbourne and Brisbane. So really, no surprise that the national price fell by a similar amount to the Sydney price, because the Sydney price uh, or Sydney's contribution is the main uh, the main volume, volume. for uh, for the national price. Um, uh, but again, look at Brisbane. Again, that southeast quite Queensland energy. Brisbane unit prices uh, didn't fall. They're up by 2.4% percent grain. Mm-hmm. Big rise. And, of course, Brisbane's not a small unit market. It's a big unit market. Yeah. We don't have to go back very far to see all those headlines that, you know, Brisbane oversupplied, Brisbane unit market oversupplied, <laughs> you know. Uh, you won't get a tenant. You won't get a buyer for years in that Brisbane market. And now they're screaming for more units. You know, there is a queue a mile long looking for units either to rent or to buy in uh, in that Brisbane city area. And uh, no surprise, we've seen prices rising, even in the holiday period, up by 2.4%. Uh, Adelaide down 2.3%. Adelaide and Perth are much smaller unit markets, um, Graham. Um, so they tend to be more volatile in terms of their, uh, their results. So... Uh, yeah, another big result there for Brisbane. Melbourne down a little bit over the month. But as I said, early signs are that that Melbourne unit market is starting to pick up. I think there's a lot of value there, and we await the next few months of results to see if that follows through. When we look at the full year results, not as strong as uh, for houses, Sydney, uh, with units up 4.7%. So that's about half what the houses achieved, but it's the reverse of what we saw in 2022. So if we look over the two-year period, it's, it's sort of evened out. Uh, Melbourne up 3.2%, a similar result to houses. But look at Brisbane, up nearly 15%, Graham, unit prices in Brisbane. And again, we, you know, we're validating again that very strong southeast Queensland market. Adelaide and Perth also strong results over the past year, even though, as I mentioned, they have, um, uh, they have smaller unit markets, so they do tend to be uh, quite volatile. But nonetheless, Adelaide unit prices up 14.6% and Perth unit prices up 11 0.2%. Uh, similar, the peak, previous peaks for Sydney and Melbourne for units are still below where they were in 2022. Good value in that Melbourne unit market, uh, Graham, still down by 6.2%. I think those value perceptions will drive buyers into the Melbourne market. But uh, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth are all at record prices in terms of the, of the cycle. Yeah. So still some value there, particularly in Melbourne for unit buyers. And uh, as we've seen with houses, the trends for the uh, the trend for prices growth is downwards over uh, January, just reflecting the continual easing in activity that we've seen over the back end of the market following a very strong year overall. And that's just part of the, the sort of the cyclical rebalancing of our housing markets uh, going forward. So I think it was a pretty predictable result, Graham, over uh, the January quarter. Um, yeah. You heard it first here. An easing, nothing spectacular here, just a, a moderate easing or a stabilisation of prices growth uh, once we move fully through the holiday period. Um, not that I think there was a lot of seasonality involved in these results. There isn't in the way we, uh, uh, the way we uh, model our data. So, um, as I said, I think it's a, a, there's, there's certainly no falling or crash activity here uh, and just a real nice setup for the rest of the year, you know, following what was a very strong uh, 2023 overall. Um, now, we've also got a, a if, if those that are listening to the podcast, watching the, watching the YouTube, if you want to get a copy of that house price report, this is a link to the PDF file for that uh, particular report for the January house price report from my housing market. So if uh, you take a snapshot of that, it'll give you a link, which will take you to the PDF file which will give you all the full details and the prospects for 2024 uh, on the My Housing Market January 2024 house price report. So that was all very exciting, wasn't it, Graham? I can tell that you're on the edge of your seat. and um, But that's all right. No, Always. it's good because it's, uh, it's good to start the year off. Here we go. We're off and running with our first house price data. Now, the latest uh, data on the economy is the ABS retail sales uh, data. Retail sales didn't surge over December. They actually fell. 
but they did surge over November. So retail sales down by 2.7% over the month. Um, but this, this is the interesting thing, right? Even though they did fall over December, and that was expected because as we uh, as we, we said last month, the November result was very, very strong. We expected that uh, because of Black Friday. Um, and even though it did fall 2.7%, retail sales are still, Graham, tracking higher than where they were a year ago, still up 58 <laughs> Of a percent, so we're still not tracking lower than where we were a year ago. So the consumers are out there still spending at the COVID stimulus package levels, um, and uh, so we're, we're still reflecting a vibrant, strong economy where people are still spending. They're still confident enough uh, to be, you know, out there as consumers, um, particularly with retail sales. So. Uh, even though it was an expected fall from what was a very very strong November, which we you know we know because of those Black Friday sales every year, um, our levels are still tracking higher than where they were a year ago, and are still tracking higher than the uh, the COVID stimulus package levels. And when we look at the chart, you can see that Graham uh, just bounced down a bit compared to um, previous month because that was Black Friday, but you can see we're still higher than a year ago. And when we look at the numbers pre-COVID, we're massively ahead of where we were pre-COVID. Uh, and even accounting for more people through migration and higher retail prices as a result of inflation, uh, it still doesn't account for the high levels of uh, retail sales that we're still recording. Well, uh, in fact, we're, we're still right at 40% higher, Graham. We still know, Doc, that there was no mortgage prison. There was no, no. mortgage cliff. People no. have never been more ahead of their mortgages historically ever, and no. people have still got savings they're leaning on through the COVID stimulus era. So it makes sense that people are still out there spending money after being locked down and suppressed for years. Makes well, sense are. to me. And, and they've all got a job, and they've all got their choice of another job if they want it, maybe yeah. another five yeah. jobs if they want yeah. it. And wages are growing at record levels. So there's plenty yeah. of incentive to get out there uh, and uh, reap the benefits of higher wages in a very strong, still very strong labour market. Now, we're not saying things aren't tough, that higher mortgage rates have certainly mm -hmm. constrained some household budgets. Inflation but they're still, is lower than they were, they're still lower than they were years That's right. ago, Doc. That's right. Um, so so you still haven't reached lower, the but your cost of living has increased, but our wages have gone up. So it's, and That's exactly you know, right. And our house prices are up spending. again. And our, and, our biggest asset, and our biggest asset, our house price, has mm. increased by 10% last year, you know, making yeah. us all feel pretty good in that sense. Um, and, of course, you know, yes, we've had higher interest rates, but for goodness sake, we started at zero, Graham, zero, nothing. <laughs> you know, the official rate was zero. Um, <laughs> and our mortgage rates have gone from 4 to about 6%, um, you know, a little bit higher for some. but. You know, in context of where we were at the last increase in interest rates, which was a decade ago, we're still the best part of a percent below where interest rates were a decade ago. So, um, you know, and, and I think that's all part of the story, why we're still seeing these big numbers for retail sales, you know, that people are still, and you can't hide this data. It's, you know, it's quite clear that retail spending is continuing uh, at least at the COVID stimulus package levels. Um, you know, and we're yet to really see the impact on uh, of high interest rates on retail spending. You know, in, in, and when we look at the real context of this, um, you know, how far ahead we still are above those pre-COVID levels. Notwithstanding m migration surge, notwithstanding inflation, it's still a very big number and still reflects what is a very strong and confident economy going forward. So we await to see, of course, coming months in terms of that. But, you know, the other thing is, Graham, and we're going to discuss this now, I think, you know, the prospects of higher interest rates are now diminishing. Um, you know, I think if we've got any any high, any rate increases left, and we'll talk about that when we get the decision in more depth next week, I think mm. if we've got uh, any prospects of high, it's only going to be one or two, uh, you know, notwithstanding anything coming out of left field. And the big thing to come out of left field would be a surge in the price of oil. Mm. Um but other than that, I, I, we've, we've sort of moved through the peak of our uh, of our interest rate cycle. Uh, Australia 
the reserve bank's probably been maybe a little bit lucky that times are working in their favour, circumstances have worked in their favour. They probably should have had interest rates higher, but well below where the US rates are. Um, but we might just be lucky enough to end this cycle with our rates, um, you know, with our rates lower than perhaps, you know, they should have been, certainly lower mm. than uh, comparable uh, global economies. So will rates remain on hold to begin 2024? We'll, we'll know next Tuesday at around about 2.30, Graham, when they announce yeah. their first decision for the year. Um, I think it's going to be pretty easy. And I think it's likely that rates will be on hold. We've had the last of the data, which came out today, hot off the press. But we'll look at some of those factors that the Reserve Bank will be thinking about. And, of course, the first thing is inflation. That's why we have higher interest rates at the moment, because we did see inflation surge over 7%, which was the highest levels that we've had since the early 80s, early 70s. So it was a real breakout. Um, it was due to COVID that we had all that stimulus. People were spending they couldn't get their cars. They couldn't get their couches. Petrol went through the roof because the price of oil went through the roof, uh, and that all worked its way into higher inflation. So, hello, reserve banks, central banks, do your job. And their job is, you know, their their law says that uh, when inflation rises, you've got to push up interest rates to take demand out of the economy. That's what they've done. Of course, we've had 13 interest rate increases, Graham, since May 20. 22, which is a record surge in interest rate increases. Of course, it did start from zero, officially from zero, well, 0.1%, so that's probably zero. Um, and uh, we did have an interest rate increase in November on Melbourne Cup Day. But the last result was a pause over December, um, and I think that we're likely to see another pause. The latest data on inflation showed another significant fall in inflation over December, Graham. Inflation down again. In fact, underlying inflation is now tracking at just 4% frame. Um, so that's, you know, well down on the 4.6% it was over the previous month. And uh, the, the trend is clearly downwards now. Um, now. Now, the factors that have pushed inflation down are um, house building costs are, are continuing to ease. Oil has fallen away still. and um, uh, uh, electricity prices, Graham, interestingly enough, fell through the floor over December. Now, that's because we've now got the, uh, we're accounting for these government uh, support packages for uh, electricity bill payers and now get uh, very high subsidies for their bills. And that's taken electricity out of the, uh, out of the household costs equation, which is significant because that has been driving up inflation. That's helped to pull it down uh, again. Um, so, uh, you know, this is working in favour, obviously, of uh, Reserve Bank having on hold. So this is good news. Another sh a sharp fall in monthly inflation. Um, and, and the target for the Reserve Bank is 2 to 3% Graham, for underlying inflation. We're at 4% now. So I guess we're in screaming distance of, uh, of getting there. So... Uh, this would be, you know, good news for the Reserve Bank. I was going to say, Doc, they need to buy a lotto ticket. <laughs> yes, it's, <laughs> it's worked out. Know. It's worked out pretty well, mate. But there I mean, is a joker old, in the pack. Poor old, poor old Philip Lowe with all his low acts. Now he should have went harder <laughs> sooner. And mate, the bloke sounds like he got ousted for nothing. He, they could come out smelling like roses at the end. All of this. Ah, oh, yeah, but it wasn't just <laughs> one mistake, there, mate. But, uh, nah. but yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Uh, but, hey, there is a joker in the pack, and that is that the latest data, and we've got to understand that even though we saw oil prices, uh, its contribution to CPI fuel costs fall again over December, um, it, there is a lagged effect on the impact of the price of oil um, per barrel that we see internationally and the price at the Bowser and the price yeah. that then uh, works its way into the CPI measurement, the inflation measurement. Latest data isn't looking uh, good, and, and of course this is very volatile, but oil prices have increased over the past week, Graham. So if oil prices start to increase again and there's a lot of shenanigans going on in the Middle East, uh, then that will work its way back into higher inflation. And it's mm. a, a very significant contribution to higher inflation. But all the other factors are, are broadly working 
uh, towards lower inflation. We're not back to our target range yet. We've still got a way to go. Uh, and I noted that rents were up again by a record amount uh, over the year, uh, house rents, and that's a big concern for inflation going forward, uh, even though there was some offset for that through the government's rental assistance program. So the government can't keep offsetting increases in rents, um, you know, given how strongly those that rental growth is. Um, but so we're not out of the woods, but the sun is just looking like breaking through from still a couple of black clouds uh, floating mm. around up there, right? So building costs are still falling. They're still high. Home rents are still rising strongly. Uh, and other factors other than inflation, we've started to see the unemployment rate just ticking up a bit, 3.9%, the latest data, uh, which is now up from its lows, its historic lows of 3.5% through last year. Now, a lot of that is migration. Obviously, more people coming into the workforce is putting up um, the unemployment rate. But look, nonetheless, and the participation rate, it would have been even higher but the participation rate fell because people are now uh, not as engaged in the workforce. Uh, but nonetheless, that's a good number for the Reserve Bank because they can say, okay, it looks like you know we're starting to see higher interest rates work, at least theoretically, regardless of the other reasons. Um, so that's what they want, to have some sort of a handbrake on spending. And if people get perhaps a little concerned about their job prospects, well, that's a start. But certainly the unemployment rate is still super, super low and still mm. a super, super strong labour market. Um, but nonetheless, it's moving in the right direction from the Reserve Bank's uh, point of view. As we saw before, retail sales have fallen, even though they're still high, but at least they've fallen. Uh, house price growth, the Reserve Bank is a little obsessed with house prices. Uh, it, they keep putting the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse, if you know what I mean. Um, and they should be really ignoring what's happening in the housing market as a driver of interest rate decisions, but they don't. They made so many mistakes based on that type of an insight. You know the the ridiculous bubble scenario, which uh, you know has has completely uh, discredited a number of those in the Reserve Bank who've uh, ascribed to that particular theory. Um, but they they have continued to mention house prices as part of their decision making in uh, for interest rates, which is a nonsense, as I said. But at the end of the day, house price growth, as we've seen today. Uh, is easing, so there's less concerns about that. Um, and uh, the, uh, and as I said before, our Australian rates are well below the US, but uh, Australia's inflation rate is well above the US. So that sort of shows we're a little bit out of sync, So which is a bit of a negative. But the big picture is internationally, Graham, that the US and Europe are currently talking about, guess what, rate cuts. So the mm. conversation there is about when are you going to cut rates? Well, that's a stupid proposition because the last thing you want to do is to cut rates in strong economies and then re in, in, in not reignite inflation, no, for inflation. goodness sake. Like you know, uh, the bonfire. Yeah, and, and rates are already still low, as we've mentioned, compared to the pre-COVID position or certainly, you know, historically low. Although, uh, but although this is don't, we have, don't we have these funny things this year in America and Australia called an election? That's right, Graham. Yes, I'm glad you oh, mentioned that. So if, we, so if there's a yes. bit of interest rate reduction spins and promises, that might yeah. help with the votes. Well, maybe the pollies are trying to talk that one up, mate, because it's a good news story. But actually, it's a bad news story because usually lower interest rates means you've got to stimulate a weakening economy. But mm. this is the markets all trying to get a margin, all trying to get the suckers in there betting that interest rates are going to fall so they can make a margin on it and make lots and lots of money. And what do they yep. care if they're proven wrong? I mean, I saw that the market, whatever that is, in the US, and gee whiz, is that not the biggest bunch of gobbledygookites you've ever heard in all your life? Is what the drivel that comes out of the US financial media? And you know, really, if if you had half a brain, you just do exactly the opposite to what the media says in the US in regard to its financial markets. They are wrong month in, month out in regard to their uh, forecasts on economic data. And it was only a couple of months ago, Graham. Let me tell you this that the markets were predicting a 100% prospect, 100%, so there's no margin here, that rates would be cut in the March meeting of the US Fed Reserve. They said 100% rates are going to be cut in March, right? Uh, and that was what they were predicting, and they were taking bets on that. People were hedging against that. 
uh, or in favour of it. Um, and guess what it is now? It's 60%. So I would have thought 100% means 100%, Graham. When you nah, say something's no 100% is going to happen, it's going to happen. You can say 99.9% just to be safe or smart, and I don't think those American, uh, you know, uh, financial journalists and maybe financial journalists generally aren't that smart if they're not at least hedging their bets to some degree by saying, well, 99.9%, we're going to get a rate cut in March. And then they can say, oh, well, if it doesn't happen, that was the 0.1 of a percent chance that it wouldn't happen. Not 100%. I think, Doc, that the weatherman or the weather lady might be more reliable than the Australian and US uh, financial analysts and media. Absolutely, Graham. But look, there's agendas here. There's money to be, yeah. to be made. I mean, who cares? But if you start if you start investing on the basis of this rubbish, that's yeah, when you start you know. to get burned, right? And that's yeah. and they don't care because they'll be just putting your money in their pocket going forward. Yeah. So I, I think the big picture is the fact that we have that conversation currently in the US and Europe. Around about, even though it's nonsensical, about the cut cuts, imminent cuts in rates, uh, despite very strong economies and still high inflation, um, or relatively high inflation. I think that shows the conversation is nowhere near higher rates. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no discussion anywhere of higher rates now, and I think that is is the icing on the cake for the Reserve Bank because they can sit on their hands, thinking, well, you know, we're as safe as houses here uh, going forward in terms of having another. Uh, another poor. So I think we're just about, I'm not going to say 100%, Graham, but uh, I'll say 99.9%, 99.9% sure that we're going to get a, a poor, another pause in interest rates. So we look forward to that decision next week, uh, which we will discuss on the next, uh, on the next show. And we will, we will go through what the Reserve Bank actually says in terms of the notes to the meeting. So, uh, as we always do, that's it for, the, for this week, a big show, as we always do. We offer our wonderful little freebie, which is our My Housing Market um, uh, Infinity app, uh, house price value app. It's not value. It's what, uh, what house uh, current asking prices and rents are uh, to sh- tell you what a sense of what your home is worth. So we've got the QR code up there. If you take a, a picture of that, it'll give you a link to the app. You do need a password. Let me say that front up, and Graham will provide you with that password under certain circumstances. He will provide you with the password to this great little app. Um, so that's the QR code for the app. Uh, and the app, what the app does is it gives you, uh, for every suburb in Australia that has data, it will give you the current asking price, not just the median asking price, but the uh, high and low asking price, um, not just for prices, but also for rents. For every suburb, uh, it'll also tell you the number of properties for sale or for rent in that particular suburb. Um, you can filter the results for uh, for each suburb, uh, for suburbs in each uh, uh, of the capital cities, each of the regional areas. You can filter for suburb. You can filter for the type of property, uh, house unit or a townhouse, and you can also filter it, grain for the number of beds. This is fantastic. So. You can look for a one-bedroom unit in a particular suburb and it will give you those results. We've got a screenshot there. Uh, we've used Blacktown as an example there for uh, uh, for the particular app and we can see there with a Blacktown house uh, of a five-bedroom house in Blacktown, currently median price of $1.23 million, a high of $1.5 million, a low of 850000 and uh, there are currently 12 properties for sale. You can uh, also do that for rental properties as well. Look forward to some updates, Graham. We keep saying this every week, and it is coming. Um, we're going to have yields as well. We've discussed yields today, what an important forward indicator they are uh, of uh, the prospects for particular markets uh, and suburbs, regions, and also um, they're, they're a key to that decision-making process Uh very much looking forward to that, Doc, because with serviceability constraints at the moment, yes. yield is a critical factor into what you can or cannot borrow when buying a property, if it's an investment, uh, that is, of course. That's right. And, w- and when you look at average yields on a capital city or regional basis, and then you compare it with a suburban yield, it can point you in the direction of a good value market, potential value market. So we'll look at yields. We'll probably filter that for a minimum of 10 uh, of 10 uh, observations, 10 sales, 10 listings, 
uh, 10 listings um, to make sure we get a, a, a robust result. And we'll also maybe put up the top 10 suburbs in each capital city or each region yeah. for yield. So that'll point you in another direction. Now, this is invaluable stuff, Graham. And for those that are, you know, uh, taking a scientific approach, which you should do to property selection uh, or certainly to market uh, activity and market energy, this is just another add-on to this app, uh, which makes it a great uh, a great uh, part of the decision-making process for property. Next week, uh, we're going to have the rent report next week, Graham. Uh, the January rent report, another horror story probably for tenants there. Mm. Uh, as I said, all the forward indicators are that it's getting worse, not better. Yeah. I'll just give you a, a bit of a quick update. It looks like Sydney house rents have gone through the roof again. Uh, so after a period where they were reasonably steady, it looks like house rents in Sydney are now accelerating, which is really bad well, news. We had houses and units in Sydney sort of aligned at 750 yes. a week quite yes. a long time ago. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, now it looks like pushing up towards 800 a week for houses, but we'll look at the latest data. Yeah, I know, which is a shocker. Uh, That's a huge the RBA, it, It's, you know, it's just a nightmare and no relief in sight. Uh, the February RBA rate decision uh, we've already discussed. Uh, we've alluded to December inflation. We'll have another quick look at that with the official data uh, posted. And um, let's have a look at the home building approvals, which will be released later this yeah. week. Also, so lots of information coming up next week. Another big show, Graham. Uh, where do you think you'll be? Oh, no, I'll be <laughs> back in the office. I'll be back in the office first thing tomorrow morning. So, had my good luck with couple that. Of days yes. of planning and and designing and, and getting everything sorted for our community, and we're we're put back into full swing. So, yes, good on you, mate. It's uh, we have we've started the year as I said. Next uh, Saturday is the first. Weekend of auctions, so we can start talking about how the market's moving on a weekly basis, as we do. And again, gee, that proved to be a fantastic forward indicator last year. We were talking that way all the way through, and it preempted all the price data. Those clearance rates are, are great forward indicators uh, for what's happening generally in the market. So we'll have the first lot of those out next week, and we'll be able to compare where the beginning of the season is this year. To where it was a year ago, Graham. I'm, so, I'm looking uh, forward to that, Doc, because we've got a masterclass this weekend. So our, that's right. our masterclass yes. attendees this weekend will see that data before anyone else on anybody Sunday else. morning. And that's 100%. They will see it before anybody else. So we can really discuss uh, what the market energy is beyond the January house price report. So that'll tell Absolutely. us what's happening with buyers and sellers on the ground. And I look for that. So great to chat again, Graham. It's been a, another great show, hasn't it? Lots to talk about. Always. First with the latest house prices as usual, um, and next week we'll be pretty much first with the latest rents as well. So uh, all good. And the interest rate decision. We will. We will indeed. And looking forward to Sunday. So we're going to have a big group of informed attendees from the Masterclass who are going to be informed before anyone else from these auction clearance rates this weekend. So pretty excited for that. And we'll, uh, we'll see you then. Good on you, Graham. I'm excited too. Thanks, Doc. See you, mate. See you, mate. Bye.